We're going to start back in 1910 with a minor scandal that unfolded in the Salon des Indépendants. There was a painting by a painter uh, named Joachim Raphael Boronali called Sunset Over the Adriatic that was submitted, that was shown, um, and that was even praised, and I believe even sold. But shortly after this, it came out that Joachim Raphael Boronali didn't exist, um, and that this painting wasn't in fact painted by a human but was painted by a donkey named Lolo who lived at the Café Lapin Agile in Montmartre. This was a hoax that was more or less masterminded by the writer and artist named Robert uh, Dorgelès, uh, along with his friends at the, the Lapin Agile, which included a whole bunch of very famous artists like André Dorin and Picasso, and so on and so forth. Um, so, of course, they were sending up. This was a, basically a travesty of, of the, 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 newer, the newer painting. Um, well, how he did it, he, uh, he had Lola stand uh, basically in front of the canvas and tied a paintbrush to, um, uh, to, the, to, to her tail and uh, started putting food, like nice tasty vegetables, in front of her uh, and her tail started to, um, uh, started to move from side to side and hence we have the gestural marks on the, on the painting. If we move forward to 1967, we have uh, an artwork that is specifically an artwork and not, not, a ho not a hoax, but another artwork that involves equines. And here we have the, the Greek artist Yanis Kounalis and his very famous exhibition of 12 horses in Rome called Untitled uh, Cava Cavalli. Um, Kounalis was part of the, uh, of the Arte Povera movement in, in Italy which used uh, very humble, quote-unquote, natural materials, um, back, back to basics, um, back to raw, raw materials and raw, raw medium. Um, and so this installation is often read as, uh, uh, as having to do with, well, both class, uh, in the sense that um, the, the horses are signs of, 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 ag of agriculture, um, but also uh, the obsolescence of horsepower and the obsolescence of, of, of the rural and the emergence of um, industry and, and, and modern urban, urban centers. Um, so here is another example of, of, uh, of equines, of, uh, in this case horses, as part of a work of art. We're going to move away from horses and go to, to birds, specifically p pigeons, and we're going to go to a much more recent work by Kader Atia, the French, French, Argeli, uh, French Algerian artist. Um, this is his work from 2005 called Flying Rats, and it's an installation within a large cage uh, sort of uh, structure, basically made with chicken wire and, uh, and, and, and wooden posts, and inside as the, as the audience member, you could walk around it. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't walk in. Because inside you had uh, children made of bird seeds, um, but clothed with actual clothing. So there's this really uncanny resemblance to, to, to real children uh, playing inside of this kind of uh, play pen. Then the artist released a whole bunch of pigeons. Um, and as you can see, the pigeons, uh, as as, as they're wont to do, they're, they're going to go eat the, the seeds and have a great time. And so they start eating the kids, essentially. So this starts to look like a scene right out of Hitchcock's Birds in many ways. Um, it's, a, it's a disturbing work uh, in a number of ways. And one of the ways in which it's been interpreted, I think it's compelling, is uh, tapping into sort of xenophobic and anti-immigrant uh, uh, sentiments. In, in Europe, um, so there's this idea of the, of, of the pigeon uh, being called a flying rat. That's the name, I think, even in New York City. They're sometimes called flying rats. So the idea that these, these animals are simply vermin, they're disease-ridden, um, and they should be, you know, uh, uh, if they're thought of, thought of at all, they should, be, they should keep to themselves um, for the most part. There are lovers of pigeons out there. Um, but the, the, the pigeons sort of stand in for, uh, for, for outside forces, uh, for dangerous outside forces that are coming for your kids, essentially, right? 
Um, so th those are, so this this work sort of tapped into uh, a kind of a xenophobic uh, energy, um, which of course taps into the larger question and crisis of immigration in in uh, in Europe, but also but also elsewhere. So we have three works. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. We have we have three works uh, that I think we can talk about within the context of delegated performances. Um, and in this case, it'd be delegated non-human performers. Um, so it's often the case in history that uh, first on the scene, or those that are, that'll be tested out, will be non-human animals before human subjects are used. So in one sense, this may be an interesting genealogy for delegated performances, which is what Bishop talks about uh, for in, in, in the chapter that we're, we're reading for this, for this week. Um, of course, she doesn't talk about non-humans. Non she doesn't talk about non-human animals as, as performers. But I think it would be interesting for us to think about it and think through what it means, um, how it fits with her designation of, of delegated performer, maybe how it doesn't. Um, but I just wanted to bring it in as, as a genealogy beca because, again, uh, here is Laika. This is the first animal to enter orbit. A about, a, 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 about a decade before, Fruit flies were the first, you know, basically the first creatures to leave, to enter space. Uh, fruit flies were sent into space. Um, then a decade later, uh, uh, mammals and other animals started being uh, being shot up in, into space uh, by the Soviets uh, and by and by the U.S. Um, space programs. And Laika is very famous, uh, so she was uh, the, the the first the first animal to enter enter orbit, um, and then unfortunately uh, didn't um, didn't survive didn't su didn't survive the journey didn't didn't make it back. Um, so here is an example of delegating uh, a role to a non-human, uh, which eventually will will go to a human, um, because of course Laika and other and other non-human animals were put up into space to see how bodies. Would react to the journey and to be tend to be in space. So this is obviously not art. Uh, and it's not even within an art context, but it is um, part of a part of a history of working and using animals, and 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 testing through the animal body before moving on to the, to the human body. And so what I'm pointing out here is that it's possible that uh, the history of delegated performances in art were first tried out through non-human non-human bodies and in fact lolo um, that that hoax from the salon des indépendants in 1910 that could be the first uh, delegated performance um, ever if not one of the one of one of the first ones ever and one of the ways where this might be compelling um, we're going to turn next to bishop's definition and sort of start unpacking and understanding what she means by delegated performance uh, and the different categories. And one of the things you're going to see that she underscores is that the turns towards delegated performances, where you essentially outsource someone to do something for a work of art, there's usually an emphasis on the immediacy of the body of that performer. So you can kind of check that here. We have that in all three of these instances. Um, there's, idea, there's an idea that they need to not be artists or actors, uh, that there, there's something non-artist, non-actor about them, uh, which lends it not only immediacy, but also authenticity. Um, so you can check that uh, with all of, all, all of these three as well. Um, and there's also an idea that they perform their identities. Um, Bishop will talk about socioeconomic identities, especially having to do with, with race and class. Um, and I think one of the reasons she doesn't talk about uh, non-humans and, and non-animals within this genealogy is, I think, maybe the understanding that animals or what it means to be a species or species being is simply not a social economic um, uh, um, tag or, or construct. Um, but I think that's actually not right. Uh, I think the idea of species and the idea of species beings and how donkeys, horses, and pigeons are understood is very much part and parcel of socioeconomic concerns and cultural, um, and cultural projections and the ways in which they fit 
within within certain traditions. So in all three of these instances, there is a way in which these these non-humans are used to perform their species being, um, whether or not that species being actually correlates to what they really are as earthlings, um, as, as, as biological entities, um, or they're just fitting into a role, a trope, that's been placed on them for, for centuries or, or, or sometimes even even longer. Um, so in the case of Lolo, it's the you know sort of the dumb brute, the the, the animal who obviously isn't an author, um, obviously isn't an artist. Um, whether or not non-humans can be artists is is a, is a question people debate today in interesting ways. Uh, for Cunellus, we're talking about um, performing horsepower and the obsolescence of of horsepowered um, industry. Um, and, and, and the countryside and naturalness and so on and so forth. Um, and, and of course, for Karo Atia, we're talking about projections of fear, uh, projections of disease and vermin um, and infestation, um, which taps into sort of cultural fears about the other um, and xenophobic tendencies um, um, in, in, in culture and in, and in politics. So there, there is a way in which we can talk about and think through delegated non-human, non-human, non-human performers. Again, as a genealogy working towards the, uh, the phenomenon of using human uh, performers in a, in a delegated way. So what does Bishop mean by uh, delegated performances? What's the, its definition and what are its different modalities or permutations? Um, the first and most basic is, I think I've already accounted for this, is the, the act of hiring non-professionals or specialists in other fields other fields than art, to undertake the job of being present and performing at a particular time in a particular place um, on behalf of the artist, so following the artist's instructions. Uh, and this is what delegation means. This is what it means to, to, to delegate. There's something managerial, managerial about this. Um, you're, you're directing and telling people um, what to do in, in the conditions they find themselves in, and, and you've set up for them. Um, so it might be interesting to talk about this conception of the artist as uh, a managerial conception of, of the artist. Um, and then it's also important to point out, which we've already, which we've already brought up, is that oftentimes the, the, the performer who's being delegated, uh, they're there to perform their socioeconomic category, like they're there to be themselves, they're there to be real, so to speak. Um, so they're there to perform their gender, their class, their ethnicity, their age, their disability. Um, and then sometimes, we'll, as we'll see, also their job, their, their, prove- their, their profession. Um, so there's something about delegated performances where they're really trying to introduce uh, non, uh, non-professional peoples who can, who can be themselves. And so I think it's probably not a coincidence that around the 80s and definitely into the 90s, the phenomenon of reality television becomes quite the force. Um, and we're going to see sometimes implicit and sometimes explicit connections with the with reality television um, and I think we can see connections here with people on reality televisions performing them themselves so that's going to hook up with with what we're talking about here um, and there are really three different categories that are related to each other but have their own distinct qualities of delegated performances so the first one is to, to use non-professionals who perform their identity the second type is to hire professionals who perform their expertise. We're going to see a couple examples of that. Uh, and then the third is to have a delegated performance, to, to work with, with non-actors, uh, but not for a live immediate situation, but for a quasi-staged setup that is filmed, um, uh, for, uh, that is filmed and then is projected um, either as film or, or on, on, on video, so an image moving, moving image practice. Um, so those are the three different modalities of delegated performances. And I think before we even look at examples, we might want to think about the socioeconomic backdrop of these works, which, you know, they begin in the 1990s. And as Bishop says, they're largely a phenomenon of Western art um, and, and biennial art. Um, and so what, what are some of the larger historical factors that we might work with? Uh, to, sit, to situate these works. The first, which Bishop talks about at the end of the previous chapter, 
on the former West chapter, is this new the, the, this newfound importance of the word project and to think of, of, of art, uh, but not only art, but also labor, also like when we work, um, no longer thinking in terms of careers, but thinking in terms of moving one from one project to the next. So this will be familiar to all of us who are working in precarious jobs and precarious positions, um, working from one contract to the next or one project. Uh, project to the next. Um, and this is what Boltansky and, and Caipello, the two sociologists that write a really massive but interesting book, uh, a massive and interesting book called The New Spirit of Capitalism, where they talk about uh, the new, this new projective city, where, where the, the labor in cities are now, um, there's now an emphasis on contacts, there's now an emphasis on parlaying one job to the next, one project uh, to the next, as the as the new spirit of, of capitalism. Another important term, of course, is outsourcing. Um, so the phenomenon of companies and you know large corporations outsourcing labor uh, to different to different countries, uh, where labor is cheaper, uh, less regulated, um, all in the name of uh, all in the name of, of profits and efficiency. Um, so the idea of outsourcing and the word outsourcing itself would be a really interesting history history to, to trace and see how it how it hooks up with these um, these forms of outsourcing performers in, in, in artworks. Um, identity politics, I think, is also important because this is these begin in the in the nineties, uh, and one could trace a parallel history of identity politics becoming a major feature of. Of art and contemporary art, um, often the, the the Whitney Biennial of 1993 is usually seen to be as the touchstone exhibition where identity politics arrives um, in 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 the United in the United States. Um, so this emphasis on identity, um, this emphasis where we could even we can even look at um, theorists like like uh, Judith Butler who talk about performance and uh, performing uh, performative. Um, uh, performative theories of, of identity, these things seem to be uh, in the air. So if delegated performances are about performing identity, then it seems natural to talk about the phenomenon of identity politics, um, which the, hist the history I know of it is, it definitely is U.S.-centered, and then it moves and becomes a preoccupation in other parts, in other parts of the world. Um, and I think we're probably today, these many decades later, we're seeing the, the backlash of identity politics, um, not only in this country, but also in other parts of the world, in European politics, and so on and so forth. So I think the notion of identity and identity politics is important to keep in mind with these works. Um, and so all three of these Bishop talks about, uh, project outsourcing and identity politics, I did want to throw, uh, throw another candidate uh, which is the experience economy, um, and not so much uh, 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 delegating uh, or, or being a delegator, but almost like self-delegating or experiencing uh, an, ec an economic life that is about delegating oneself. Uh, and so this can take on many forms, but think of either uh, positions, jobs, so labor, or uh, maybe more obviously things that, that one buys, so um, consuming um, and consumption, that these at a certain point, and probably beginning in the 90s, became tied up in, uh, in identity uh, in, in, in various ways. So if one consumes a certain object, they're not simply buying it, they're also becoming someone who buys this object and all these other associated um, all, the, all these these associated connotations, which may be moral, ethical, political, social, what have you, right? So there is there's there's some way in which the the experience economy, where we're no longer just working or buying, but through our work and through our consumption, we're forming our subjectivity, or we're um, we're identifying with certain forms of 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 um, of social, ethical, and political being. Um, that then it's almost as if it's it's delegating us or we'll, we're self uh, we're self delegating um, in this experience economy. So again, I think these are all interesting things to talk about within the context of these works. But let's get let's get to some examples. 
Um, some of them will be from the chapter, and some of them are um, outside to bring in to bring in different perspectives. The first example is by Maurizio Catalan. This is Southern Suppliers FC from 1991. So this is an example of um, of delegated performance uh, of non of non professionals, um, and it's confrontational in, in, in many ways. Um, it's socially and politically confrontational because Catalan uh, enlisted um, immigrants, um, non-Europeans, non, non uh, to play uh, soccer in, in, in a league. Um, and evidently they played and lost all their, all their games in, um, in, in a soccer league. Um, and one of the key aspects of, of, of the work are, are the jerseys. So if anyone who watches um, uh, La Liga or Premier League, you'll know that all the, the jerseys have sponsors. So what Catalan did, put the, put the, the word Raus, which means out, um, uh, on the, the German word for out, on the, on the front of their, their, their jerseys. Um, and uh, and this, this evokes uh, a xenophobic phrase uh, Auslander Raus, uh, foreigners get out. So Raus can also be um, translated as as get out. Um, and so I think I, can, I think you can see how this work then is uh, touching a nerve, but in such a way that it's actually not. Uh, there's something ambiguous about it. Uh, so as Catalan um, giving agency to these men to play to play soccer. Um, and then uh, giving them this kind of confrontational aspect with Raus on, on, on the t-shirt? Um, or is he manipulating? Is he exploiting uh, these men for the purposes of this delegated performance? Um, these are part of the discussions of, of these works. Um, um, and I think oftentimes um, the the works themselves lend themselves to to being like part of the point is this am, this ambiguity um, this lack of directness and not being completely clear where the artist falls in his or her intentions that seems to be a key part of of the of the works. Um, shortly thereafter, there was an artist uh, an Austrian artist named Christoph uh, Schlegensief. Uh, who did a work called "Please Love A Please Love Austria" from from two thousand, uh, and this was done in in Vienna, um, and it's it's a very complicated a very complicated work. So um, he set up a um, 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 he set up a, like a container n near the opera in a major square in in Vienna, and on top of this container he put the words "Auslander Haus," so foreigners get out um which immediately that that that's a major pro provocation um if there's one thing about um schlegenschief is that he was, he was very much a, a provocateur uh, but that wasn't the only part of this work so this was the, probably the most visible in the, in, in of, of 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 the work uh, it's probably the most visible aspect of the work because it was in the square um, but the other thing that he did is that he went to uh, a center where there were asylum, asylum seekers um, and he enlisted them. There were, I believe, 12 of them. He enlisted them to live in the container over the course of this, of this work. Um, and that's not all. The container um, was uh, recorded uh, by, by, by a camera. He was influenced by Big Brother, which was one of the very early reality shows. So what he wanted to do was set up like a Big Brother situation where these assignment seekers could be seen by the public, uh, not only in this square through the windows and through the fence, um, but also online um, through, through a video camera. So anyone could check in and see them living inside this, this container. And he took the, the he took the, the Big Brother concept all the way, because part of this work was was setting up uh, a contest where the public could vote either over internet or by phone. They could vote every week one of the or was it every day or every week the public could vote out one of the asylum seekers. Uh, so this is just like in reality shows where people are voted off the show, right? Uh, the public could vote out um, one of the asylum seekers. And the, the, 
the artist um, made it known that uh, once an, an asylum seeker is kicked off the kicked out of the container, they get deported. And so, of course, it wouldn't be a, a Big Brother type show if there wasn't a prize at the end. So the idea was that the last person, the one to survive all the votes, uh, will then receive uh, asylum, will then receive uh, citizenship, um, um, along with a, a cash prize or something like that. Um, so you can tell this is incredibly incendiary uh, as, as, as a work. Um, and like Maurizio Catalan's, though taking it much further, there's this real ambiguity here because uh, Christoph Schlingenschief uh, is is very much um, uh, very much on the on the left, um, and yet this is a, this is a really ambiguous work that seems to embrace xenophobic and more right wing kind of rhetoric, um, along with middling popular culture um, and sort of these really competitive. Um, scenarios that you find in, in reality reality t television um, and so as the work unfolds the public gets more and more animated uh, in many ways this is a delegated performance because these asylum seekers are, are, are performing themselves in this container they really were asylum seekers um, the, the public also becomes <laughs> performers uh, because you will have people, and this was an, a, a real touchstone work during that summer, hundreds of people came to the square and then started debating about not only the merits of the work, how, how right or wrong the work is, but then also the political situation in, in Austria, uh, which had recently, there was a, there was a, a resurgence of a right-wing party, and even the centrist liberal party was be, for reasons of, 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 of election purposes, uh, they were starting to talk about deportation and they were starting to make immigration an, an issue. Um, and this is actually, that was the catalyst for the work. So you can see, you saw this, you saw these center, even center left parties making immigration um, an, an issue and talking about de deporting uh, asylum seekers. He thought, wait a second, like how, how, how is this rhetoric now um, part of of the of the, the discursive landscape of, of, the, of the country's politics um, and so he took them at their word uh, and he did exactly what these parties were, were were talking about again not only the parties on the right uh, but also the center uh, um, the, the center liberal liberal parties um, which created a, a, an, an explosion so politicians had to talk about it uh, citizens would show up and, and it could, it actually became uh, pretty vehement and pretty violent. At one point, you had leftist protesters that came and liberated the asylum seekers, um, not realizing that actually uh, they probably shouldn't have taken the work at face value. Um, so this, again, is a delegated performance where the artist is really ambiguous. We're not quite sure uh, where he stands here. Um, is he for? Is he against? Like, what is he doing here? Um, in many ways, Schlegenschief's model was to, uh, depending on the context he found himself in, if he's talking to someone who's super right-wing or someone who's on the left, is simply to take the opposing side, um, to, con to continue and to maintain uh, conflict, um, and, to, and to, to, draw, to draw people out. So this, I think, is related to the, the, the notion of parafiction, which will become important um, a little bit later on. Um, and the idea of artists working with, uh, with uh, art projects that are both real but, but not real. Uh, so some days Schlegenschief would say, you know, these uh, asylum seekers really are going to get deported. And then some days he said they're not. And some days he would say they're just actors. So he kept everybody kind of in this ambiguous, in this ambiguous state. Um, and if we talk about this work when we get together, uh, I think the tone is, is really important to, to, to flesh out here because one of the, one of the things that, that's interesting about the, this work is that it seems like Schlingenschlief is, is telling us through this work that normal forms of critique or protest are over. Like you can't just come out and say, hey, it's wrong to deport people or it's wrong uh, you know, to be xenophobic or whatever. Um, and even if you... Uh, even if you roll out a really tight argument for why it's wrong, 
um, it won't really matter in a landscape where politicians are, you know, they, they become cynical when it's time to get reelected and they'll side with the with, with populist opinions. Um, so there's something about this work where where Shigenshi seems to be saying, you know, like normal criticism, normal protest, we can't do this. We have to we have to uh, uh, instigate in, in, in other ways. Um, so that's 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 an interesting way to, to talk about about this work. So it's a very complex, a very complex work. Um, and there was a, a film made, a documentary film made about it, which I highly recommend watching. Um, and I can go ahead and show you the trailer so you get sort of more context than, than what I've been able to give you here. Zum ersten Mal bildete sich in Europa eine Regierung, die Nähen zu Rechtsextremismus immer gepflegt hat. In einer Situation, wo jeder schaut, na was ist jetzt in Österreich wirklich los? Ist das jetzt ein faschistisches Land oder nicht? Dass da wirklich tatsächlich Asylbewerber in Container sitzt und da war ja dieser riesen Big Brother Boom damals und, und ein ganzes Volk oder eine halb, halb Europa kann die da rauswählen. Es war ja nicht der Schuss zu hören. Aber man sah viele Menschen, die schwer verletzt herumtrockelten oder Aua schrien. Du verfluchte Sauhunde! So now we move on to the, the work of the Spanish artist uh, Santiago Sierra, who plays a major role in this, this chapter, um, and I'm sure we'll talk um, a, a bit about his work when, when we get together from the chapter, uh, which are the more incendiary works. I wanted to bring in a, a, a work that was a little bit uh, less incendiary to give a, a different picture of, of Sierra. Uh, this, is, this is La Trampa from 2007. Uh, it's a performance that he did, a delegated performance that he did in, in, in Chile, um, and it's quite an amazing, quite an amazing uh, work. So what he did, uh, he invited a number of really important people in Chile. Uh, so this includes the president of the Chamber of Deputies, the secret secretary general of the presidency, the minister of defense, uh, an important, I think, the, the rector of the university there, the University of Diego Porta, uh, Portales. Um, a famous art critic, the director of the Contemporary Art Museum, um, and other, you know, like important personalities, like journalists and that sort of thing. So the, you know, the bigwigs were, were invited. Uh, and they were told to go through a door and go through a corridor, and, e and each one were told, were told to do this. And then when they, uh, when they went through the corridor, they found themselves on stage in front of a group of just normal, everyday people, working class Chileans, who are sitting there and just uh, looking at them. And so you can imagine what happens, uh, in, in, especially when it comes to sort of the, the more political figures. They didn't know quite what to do. Um, they didn't know if they were supposed to say anything or give a speech or whatever it is. Um, it was just this, you know, this sea of people looking at them. Um, and so for this work, it's unclear uh, as who 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 who's doing the performance, uh, who's doing the performing, and who's doing the the, the viewing, um, or do we want to think of it as different layers of delegated performance, where the workers are performing themselves, but they're given this strong presence as 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 viewers, um, to this other layer of, of more official performers that don't even know you know what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, which is kind of a deli delicious irony because most of the time, uh, big wigs, you know, like curators and politicians and so on, like they, it's a very calculated, a very clear understanding of what they're going to be doing in front of the public. 
um, and everything is very well prepared. So to just be, you know, ushered onto a stage and be surprised by a group of, 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 of human beings who are looking at you uh, must have been a, a pretty jarring, perplexing, uh, and maybe even transgressive gesture on the, on the part of, 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 of the artist. So this is another example of um, delegated performance where you're using non-professionals. Um, and from what we know about Santia, uh, of, of Sierra's other works, this is far less. This feels far less exploitive or dangerous at the level of um, of of the the, the, the the lower and working classes that that he's involving in his works. Um, Tanya Bruguera has also done work. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about her when we get to uh, pedagogy, artist pedagogy. But she's definitely done works that fall within the rubric of delegated performance. So this is Tatlin's Whisper Number no. Five from 2008. Um, this is part of the the La Monnaie Vivante um, exhibition. That it's a pretty amazing uh, exhibition. I wish I could have seen it, but an exhibition of performance works that would all be sort of um, um, put put together with in in the space. Uh, Bishop describes it. Um, in a, in a really fascinating way. And so this is Tanya Bruguera's work where she enlisted um, two police officers who were used to doing crowd control on, on horses. Um, so the theme of equines is running through this, this, um, this session um, in, in maybe a compelling way. Um, and so this is an example of delicate performance where the artist isn't working with a non-professional but working with the professional who is performing their role. Uh, you can you can YouTube this. You can see you can see videos of this. Um, there, it, for most of the videos I've seen, it was kind of cheery. Actually, uh, you know, everyone in the crowd they're being moved around. Um, it's not it's not that confrontational. At least the videos I've seen, uh, you know, um, the the police officers are are very polite. Uh, the horses seem very comfortable in this in the in the turbine hall of the Tate, so it's a very large space. They seem comfortable, uh, and people are kind of being moved around and corralled. Um, but of course, the point is is, is Bruguera sort of like bringing in the police state and bringing in sort of the management of bodies, which often happens at protests um, in in ways that are that can become far more violent um, and, and problematic. Uh, but basically, bringing in the that 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 type of force, that type of power, into um, into the the space, uh, and of course, I've only seen a few videos, so there may very well have been moments where it, it became uh, it became tense, um, and of course, I would imagine it depends who the gallery goers are um, and how they experience, and whether or not they they've experienced these type of confrontation before in their lives. So. It's a it's a rich it's a rich performance uh, performance work, um, which again has a lot to do with um, controlling um, a p police force um, in, in in society. Um, on a more poetic register, we have a work by Alora and Calzadilla, um, a, a, a couple that they work together, a, a collective, made all sorts of amazing works. This is their Raptors Rapture from two thousand twelve. Um, where they enlisted a, a flautist. Uh, her name was Bernadette. Her name is Bernadette um, um, Akafer, uh, who specializes in prehistoric instruments. So some of the very the oldest instruments that have been found uh, to date. I mean, around this time, they found a flute that was carved by one of our ancestors some 35,000 years ago. Um, and it's thought to be one of, if not the oldest musical instrument that we've that we found, um, and the the flute is made from the bone of a griffin vulture that lived thirty five thousand years ago, um, and there there are holes. You know, it's an archaeological artifact, but it's one that can still be used. Um, and so they enlisted uh, um, this 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 flautist to perform to play music on it. And what's fascinating is that we really have no idea how it was used. We have no idea what music was for, for these Homo sapiens 35,000 years ago. Um, so she does her best to try to figure out how it would have been used and what sorts of sounds can be made with it. 
um, then the artists bring in uh, another delegate, a performer, and uh, of the non-human variety, which is an actual uh, live griffin vulture, which you're seeing here. So this this was documented uh, as as a video um, where you see Kaffer uh, Bernadette Kaffer playing for this living uh, griffin vulture, which is really really poetic there's almost this evolutionary link between the this bone that's 35,000 years ago which is one of the ancestors of this griffin vulture uh, something maybe a little bit morbid about the work too uh, but it's 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 quite an incredible quite an, an incredible work so here we have a double delegated performance one of a, of a non-human performing uh, themselves uh, and one of a professional uh, someone who specializes in in prehistoric instruments. Um, I wish I had a clip of this work for you, but um, it's it's hard to find. I, I, I haven't been able to find one. We now move on to some works that are uh, mediated by, um, by by video, and arguably Rapture's Rapture, though it's a performance, uh, was uh, is now you know it's it's a, it's a video work. Um, we move on to forms of delegated performance where people are enlisted. Uh, you know, I think in each case here we're talking about non-professional, uh, non-professional uh, actors um, who perform themselves, and we begin with an example that's a bit lighter uh, because these tend to get uh, these tend to get uh, a, a little a little dark. Uh, but this is by Candice Breitz, who's a South African artist. Uh, this is called King, a portrait of Michael Jackson that she did in 2005, uh, and she went to Berlin for this one and enlisted. Uh, made a call uh, for Michael Jackson fans. So this is a little bit like Phil Collins, who's also within, we talked about Phil Collins early on in the semester, um, and the world won't listen, and the Smiths fans from around the world who, who, who do karaoke. This is a similar setup. Uh, music seems to play an important role in these delegated performances. There are all sorts of examples I can bring in that have to do with music. Um, so she went to Berlin and enlisted these everyday people who were all fanatics of Michael Jackson and she had them sing his songs. Um, it's very important though, This I did see this work in person in Sonnabend, and it's, so you, you walk in, it's a darkened space, and there are 20 more or less life-size uh, um, uh, screens, and they're standing there. Um, and they're each, they're not in the same room, they're not even there together, they're performing by themselves, and they're wearing earbuds, so you can't hear the music. They're playing along, I think, with like a greatest hits record of, of Michael Jackson. Um, so you can't, um, or it might be Thriller. It might be Thriller that they're, they're, they're singing along to. So you can't hear the actual music, but you can hear them moving. And of course, you can hear them singing. And so then the artist takes them and puts them all together into, 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 the, into the room and they're all singing together. So the togetherness, the community here uh, is not a, a real one, it's kind of an imagined one. These people who may or may not know each other weren't performing together, but they come together in this, in this, uh, in this work. So I can play a little bit for you, uh, just, just, just the beginning. She was more like a beauty queen from a movie scene. I said, oh, my, but do you mean I am the one who would dance on the floor in the round? She said, I am the one who would dance on the floor in the round. She told me her... Okay, I think we, I think we can leave it there. It's obviously a very long work because it goes through the, the whole record. Um, so it's, it's a light work. I think it's, it's, it's a fun work to experience. So there might be some critical dimensions to this work that, that, we, that, that we could talk about, um, uh, which might have to do with uh, sort of, you know, um, coming together, but actually really being apart, 
uh, issues of atomization, um, the effects of pop culture on identity, um, which can be good and maybe it can also be bad. Uh, so it's a much, it's a fun work, but I think it's much, much richer and, and we could have a nice conversation about it. And so staying with music, we, we, we can now turn to the, the Polish artist, uh, Artur Zemiewski. Uh, and this is one of his uh, earlier works called Singing Lessons. There was a, there's a Singing Lessons 1 and a Singing Lessons 2. Uh, this is the first one. And unfortunately, I can't find uh, a copy of this one to show you too, but it's a really, it's an incredible work. Uh, the one that maybe makes the viewer much more uncomfortable than the Kenneth Breitz one that, that, that we just saw. Um, so the setup is in, in many ways simple, but the, the, the resulting issues are, are pretty profound to my mind. Um, so he, he worked with um, a choir. This is in uh, Holy Trinity Church in Warsaw in Poland. Um, and he organized um, a, a choir of, of, deaf, of deaf mute children uh, to sing a mass uh, from a Polish, uh, Polish uh, composer. Um, and because they're deaf mutes, they can't hear what 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 they're doing, um, and uh, um, they 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 can't they can't hear the sounds they're 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 making. Um, and so there there is online a recording of it. So if you're interested, you can find uh, the the recording so you can hear you can hear them singing. But it's a really um, a cacophonous sound. Um, the the composition itself would be in a pretty traditional form of musical structure and tone, uh, but the way they, they sing it, um, it turns it into a like a rather atonal uh, and very in some ways very avant-garde uh, type type of work. Um, so the 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 issue here, uh, well, it's a delegated performance because he's working with uh, deaf mute children um, and having them then sing. But the, I think the real issue here is the is the observer, is the is the person watching and hearing, uh, because on the one hand it's very uncomfortable, uh, because you're hearing them sing, uh, and if you're not being generous, you might you might think, well, this sounds just terrible. Um, they sound really terrible. Um, it, it might even be painful to listen to for for certain for certain people. Um, and so the discomfort comes in, you know, uh, why is the artist um, putting them in this situation? Why is he exploiting these poor deaf mute children to do something that they that they can't that they can't do? Um, so that's on on the one hand. On the other hand, and I think if we watch it attentively, um, I have seen the work, uh, and when you listen to it. There, there are moments where they're laughing. There are moments, uh, pretty much throughout the whole thing, uh, where they're, uh, they themselves aren't uncomfortable, for the most part. Uh, they're, they're enjoying. Uh, they're enjoying what they're doing. And so then there's an, a different side of the equation here, where, where you ask yourself, um, why can't deaf mute children uh, sing in a church, um, and have a, have a fun time doing it, um, and feel fulfilled by, by being creative. Um, why wouldn't that be? Why wouldn't that be an option? Um, and if I'm feeling discomfort, uh, uh, that discomfort is is just is just mine. It's not it's not theirs, right? So there's something like all of his works. Chmielewski is quite confrontational, um, and he works a lot with the history of Poland, especially a contemporary uh, landscape, uh, which has moved further further to the to the right so he's working with polish nationalist themes in this work but a lot of times in this in his work he also uh lends visibility and agency to uh those who are disabled um those who are um who, who live in in in, for, in in uh in ways that are not normative um so to, to wish these children to not sing a mass is to have a i think like a a pretty uh, normative conception of who should or shouldn't be singing um, so Zemiewski is confronting the, the viewer with their ideas of tolerance and inclusion um, and, uh, 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 and care for those who are uh, disabled or differently abled. Um, what uh, Way back, we no longer uh, use this term, although some disability rights um, activists do use this word, uh, a cripple. 
which is the word that Zemievsky uses, um, there, there's, there's a way in which he's working with this, this community and delegating them uh, in a way that, uh, that tests the limits of, of, uh, of tolerance and, and, and inclusion um, in, interesting, in interesting ways. Um, so I, I can see how the, how the work is controversial. And I remember being, when I was a PhD student, I remember this was shown in class. There were a number of, of, of my fellow graduate students who were incensed. Like they really were uh, angered by, by, by the work, um, which I thought was uh, a viable reaction, but maybe, um, maybe, only half, maybe only half the picture. So another really fascinating work to, to, to think about. Um, a later work that he does is called Them, and this one is in, is in the chapter. Uh, this is a work where he got together four different groups, four very different groups of people. Um, um, ladies from a Catholic church, uh, young socialists, young Jews, and Polish nationalists, um, some of which who had m m like pretty right-wing, if not uh, neo-Nazi leanings. Uh, so you can imagine an artist getting these groups of people together into a space, uh, how already right off the bat this feels very confrontational and provocative. And so he had them as groups do works of art, and then allowed them to sort of critique each other's works. Uh, and as you can imagine, things started to get more and more amped up and more and more violent. Um, so, you know, uh, defacing each other's works. At one point, one, one uh, painting even gets caught on fire. At another point, one of the, one of the, the, the elderly women, one of the, the, the older women from the, the Catholic Church, she has her, her mouth taped shut. Uh, so, and, and someone else in the background you see has had their mouth taped shut, like maybe one of the young socialists. Um, so there's this dynamic that plays out that's incredibly confrontational. So it's like a, a microcosm of m macrocosmic political tension um, in Poland. Um, I, I talked about this work with my undergraduates and I, we, we wondered like whether or not this work could be staged in the United States. Um, in our own moment of, of, um, of political uh, uh, friction and, and faction um, and, and uh, partisanship, sometimes really, really um, violent forms of, of partisanship. Uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, so this is an example of a, of a delegated performance is where people are performing themselves, but it's, it's important that it's staged for a film. Um, and how much Zemievsky has a say in what went down, how much he's directing and how much they're uh, acting or not acting or he's not directing is something that's open for, for debate and ambiguous. So again, this idea of the artist is remaining ambiguous in the face of these thorny, difficult questions of social tension uh, is, is, is an important part of, 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 of these works. And I thought I'd end with a work that um, Bishop doesn't really talk about the, um, about uh, social social media and the internet within the context of delegated performances because she's largely in, in the 90s. Um, and even though, well, it's not in the 90s. Uh, we talked about the internet in the context of, of, um, of Christoph Siegenschlieff's work. Uh, but, but there are more recent artists who have been working with uh, online communities or the the you know the the the, the, cyber, the you know the, the the internet the cyberspace as as a part um, as as a part of their work as performers within within their work and I think the issues that come up here are a little different than the ones that we've been talking about which again will be interesting to flesh out uh, but this is by Wafa Bilal a Iraqi artist it's called Domestic Tension from two thousand seven uh, and the setup is pretty simple he lived in a room. Um, in, the, in the gallery space and he kind of just basically moved in there and there was a paintball gun that evidently shot out yellow paint um, that the public could log on uh, talk with the artist, chat with the artist but also move the gun uh, aim the gun throughout the room and shoot it if they wished um, at, at the artist so this is like, uh, here's a little bit more of an action shot where he's uh, he's 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 um, trying to get out of the way of someone of someone uh, shooting. So this is delegated performance, but one that 
has more to do with the online world, the online community, uh, in which forms of anonymity creep in, um, and also I, I have to I have to think also uh, conditions the way in which people behave um, when they're anonymous. They might behave in certain ways that they wouldn't if they weren't anonymous. Um, uh, and in, in some ways, uh, he's delegating them, but they're delegating him. Uh, they're sort of um, um, forcing him to act in certain ways, um, either by pointing the gun at him, or I was reading, there, there's a whole log of each day. I think he was in there for 30 days. I was reading that at some point there were a lot of people logging in, trying to keep the gun away from him because other people were trying to were trying to shoot him. Um, so it was as if... It was as if there was like um, this this ethical manifestation, this sort of spontaneous ethical dilemma that's that's put forward by this work, where uh, all these people come together online and either do the right thing or the wrong thing. Of course, depending on your perspective of what the right or wrong thing is to do um, in in this scenario, um, I would for for myself, I would probably. Uh, uh, not shoot the artist, um, but maybe there were people that thought, well, it's just part of the work, so I should I should play my role, and that they, they would shoot him knowing that they're just paintballs. Um, though I'm sure paintballs are in themselves quite quite painful. Um, so this is another example of of a delegated performance, and maybe we're coming full circle here, where this is a delegated performance of this anonymous public, but also like a self delegation on the part of the artist who's performing this role, um, and it shouldn't be lost on us that he's an Iraqi artist. This is 2007, and so uh, what sort of roles or phantasms or stereotypes is he assuming in the, in the public imagination that will make uh, certain people want to, to shoot him? Um, so a, a pretty straightforward setup, but I think you can tell um, we're dealing with some pretty complex, uh, complex issues. And so there we have it, a, a, whole, a whole host of examples of delegated performances. I hope the ones that are, that are not mentioned in the chapter sort of enrich your understanding of this type of, of these type of projects. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking about them when, when, we, get, uh, when we get together.